Okay, if you've never heard of Mike Reese, let me tell you who he is. He's written for National Lampoon. He wrote several years for Johnny Carson on The Tonight Show. He wrote Gary Shandling's show. He wrote The Critic. And he wrote The Simpsons, where he never once hired me to do a voice. And here he is now, Mike Reese. Hi, Gilbert Gottfried. This is Gilbert Gottfried's Amazing Colossal Podcast. I'm here with my co-host, Frank Santo Padre, who told me in the last uh, uh, podcast I didn't mention his name. So I'm mentioning <laughs> his name here. And I said, well, I didn't mention your name because I really consider you a total load on the show. <laughs> And uh, you just like like having weights around my ankles when I'm trying to. Uh, that was to, my goal, yes, really. So yes. I feel like I've accomplished something. Yeah, like I'm trying to run track, and you're just holding my ankles. I do what I can. Uh, yes. I do my little part. Okay. <laughs> now tonight on the show, uh, we have Mike Reese. Now Mike Reese has uh, been a writer. On The Simpsons, a show that's been on the air for like, you know, if you add it up like Gunsmoke and uh, Mesh, uh, it would be like double that. And so... <laughs> We've been on 78 years. Yes, yes. <laughs> At least. Now, my first question is, the show's been on that long. Why the fuck <laughs> didn't they ever ask me to do a voice on it? <laughs> And you have friends on the show, too? Yes, I, yes. You know people. I know everybody on the show. I know the writers. I know the people who do voices. We don't feel your voice is distinctive enough. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, if, if you, when you, next time you speak to Matt Groening... Just tell him to go fuck himself. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Tell him, I <laughs> yes. hope he dies a slow, lingering death. That's what I'll tell my boss now. in 25 years. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'll do. You mispronounced his name, which is insulting I, to him I, enough. I, never, I Is yeah. it groaning? Groaning. 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 Right. Well, tell Matt Groaning to go <laughs> fuck himself. Okay. <laughs> I, I, apolog I take back what I said before, <laughs> Matt Groaning. But it's Matt Groaning who should you go fuck himself. You've come up. Yes. You've come okay. up. Your name <laughs> yes. has come up. You, you'll, get, you'll get your shot. In what context does his name come up? It comes up. Are we, yes. You know, it's never flattering. That's yeah. the other thing. Someone says, I want to be on the show. Okay, here, we've cast you as a homeless, yes. incoherent, <laughs> incontinent man. What? I'm terribly insulted. It's like, well, that's what we do. What did you think? Gilbert Gottfried is the Duke of Winchester. Yeah, We're not going to do it. It comes up as, now remember, we never hire Gilbert Gottfried <laughs> for this show ever if we're on another 2,000 years. <laughs> now, my next question, just looking at you, I don't need to ask, are you a Jew? I am now, <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Now, you used to be a writer. Oh, well, go ahead. No, no, no. I'll I had you stick. Talk. Now my <laughs> I'll do my Jew hunk later. But yes, I, I am Jewish. <laughs> even, even people on the radio know. Even See, blind guys. Oh, happy Hanukkah. They can hear, oh, yes. your, they can hear your they, nose they, over the radio. It's, it's big. <laughs> they... They just, before you even talk on the radio, it's, they go, I think there's a Jew coming it up. It somehow pokes <laughs> out a little. Now, you were a it's writer. Big. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the no, thing, no. too. Let yes. me talk about Judaism yes. for one <laughs> sec. Which is, like I, you know anything about I it. I look yes. so Jewish. And that <laughs> joke I always do is I, I put myself through college modeling for hate literature. <laughs> <laughs> Great joke. But, you know, I'm not Jewish at all. I don't believe in it. I don't. I grew up in a town in Connecticut where we were the only Jews. I never met other Jews. And some people are Jewish by faith or by mm -hmm. culture. And I'm, I'm Jewish by faith. <laughs> <laughs> You're actually an atheist, aren't you? I am yeah. an atheist. Well, God bless you yeah. for that. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> now, you used to write for Johnny Carson I for did. The Tonight Show. Yeah. Now, what would, was Johnny Carson an alcoholic? <laughs> <laughs> I don't he know. He can't fire you now. No. He's been dead for over 20 years. Yes. He, uh, I don't know. The weird thing with Johnny Carson was you never saw him. I worked there a year and a half. I spent maybe an hour with him. He just, he, he didn't want to be around people, and he especially didn't want to be around his writers. He didn't want to see them. And there was, there was a weird day. I was working there when the day he turned 60, and we threw him a little birthday party backstage right before the show. And it was just six of his employees, and he was as nervous as a cat. He just couldn't stand to be around six people. And then he was about to walk out on stage in front of five million people. But that was it. Just that he was friendly. He, he was always that guy. And when I inter somewhere this will get interesting, but so when, I, <laughs> when I interviewed for the job, which was pretty much the first and last time I met him, he brings me and my writing partner into his office, and his office was set up like the Tonight Show said, and we just sat on the couch, and he sat behind a desk, and he interviewed us for seven minutes, and then he said something, and it got a laugh, and... He dismissed us. It was like if he could have gone to commercial in his <laughs> office, he would have. But that was the guy. That was what made him what he was, is he could talk to every, anyone for seven minutes and nobody for ten minutes. So on stage and off, he was Johnny Carson. He really was, yeah. yeah. He had a set. He had a set yeah. in his office. And that was it. He was nice. It was, it was very congenial, but we never saw him again. And then... The day we got the job, the head writer said to us, welcome to the job, you'll be fired in 13 weeks. <laughs> whenever Carson was unhappy, he'd just fire whose ever contract came up. And, uh, and we hung in for a year and a half, and then we got fired. And then two weeks later, he offered us our jobs back. Like We'd become much better writers in, in those two weeks. Wasn't he going through a, a, a bitter divorce at that time? I yes. remember reading about that. Uh, yeah. yeah, well, was this uh, 107 uh, of his divorces? This was number three, and I think yeah. this was an especially bad one. And this is a story that it, it plays like a joke, it, and it was so true. We, because, the only again, none of us knew Carson, and the only way we knew about his life was reading the National Enquirer, and so we subscribed to it at the Tonight Show. And one day at the Tonight Show, it's, it was the headline, Mrs. Carson demands $5,000 a week extra. And two of the writers looked at each other and go, gee, between the two of us, we make 5000 a week. And they got fired that <laughs> afternoon. They needed the money. <laughs> <laughs> so now, when, when the writers would submit jokes, who would look at it and tell you, uh, what was what they wanted, what they didn't like. Well, I worked, I'm embarrassed to say, there, he had two staff. The place ran like an insurance company. It was, it was so strange. So he had a staff of monologue writers in one building across the lot. And then he had us. We were the sketch writers. So we wrote Aunt Blabby and Andrew Wetness and Karnak. And uh, people didn't even seem to notice. Every night he did a piece of material, generally at the desk. He would do, well, here's 10 tips to beat the heat, or here's... Or where Ed would say, everything you yeah. want to know, and he would do the... Th those things. Yeah. Yeah. We wrote the bit, everybody hated every night. <laughs> <laughs> we, oh, we, they were great. We were the palate cleanser before Suzanne Plachette. And, Not, oh, yeah. God. So that was the job. And so they would work out, they'd say, all right, today we're writing shopping tips, and... My partner and I, Al Jean, we had to write 60 of those a day. We'd write 60, we'd give them to the head writer, he'd get another 200 from the other writers. And I think he would cut down from 200 to 20, and Carson would read those 20 and cut it down to 15, and then do nine of them on the air. And that was the attrition. And of the nine, you know, four bombed. Now, did anyone ever, in all the years Carson was on the air, go up to him and say, hey, do you realize your Aunt Blabby character is a blatant ripoff of <laughs> Jonathan Winters? <laughs> no, 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 no. 
<laughs> well, wasn't Art Fern a ripoff of Reggie Van Gleeson? Yeah. Oh, too? yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. Yeah. It was, there <laughs> was an homage. Sorry. <laughs> there was a, when I was working there, there was a, a, Carson was on the cover of TV Guide, and they had all his characters <laughs> surrounding it. And it was, I re, one of the writers just pointed to the characters and goes, Jonathan Winters, Jackie Gleason, Tommy Smothers. And, <laughs> and, and that, you know, bless his heart. I mean, Johnny Carson was great. Yeah, he stole all his, he didn't have an original character. In it. <laughs> Floyd Turbo was the ripoff of Tommy Smothers? Was that the Floyd R. Turbo? Floyd R. Turbo. I mean, was just this blatant yeah. ripoff. <laughs> You know, it never dawned on me until you just said it. That's it. I mean, it was just yeah. shy. I mean, he would steal everything. He said, like, gee, I'll take the voice and the attitude <laughs> and, and wardrobe. I mean, that was... The thing. <laughs> Leave something. Change the color of the hat. Do something. And, and, and his delivery, he'd throw in a lot of Jack Benny. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so he's he's a, a, he was a great interview, but as, as a comic... It's like you wouldn't want him sitting in the back of the room during your set. No. <laughs> there was once, I can tell you a lot of these things, but there was, he would, uh, every, every year he would read kids' letters to Santa Claus. And uh, he would read the letters. And, the, you know, the, it was like kids say the darnest thing. Mm -hmm. They were funny letters. They'd get them from the inner city schools where the kids didn't express themselves well. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, he'd read the letters, and then he would make a a humorous comment and we wrote those we wrote all the comments and they just he was so masterful at it no one would believe he wasn't ad-libbing those and i'm watching the show one night with my mom and he reads the letter and then uh he does his ad-lib and i said ma i wrote that and she goes no he just made that up so he was perfect at that and then he would always when he'd read the kids letters he'd always go he'd read them and get a laugh he goes you know you can't make this stuff up <laughs> right <laughs> Make the writers feel real good. Right. And yeah. then one year he came to us, he says, the kids let me down. You got to make this stuff up. <laughs> so we had to write funny letters to Santa from inner city kids and then write his ad libs. Wow. And that was it. Whenever, you know, he was a great interviewer with celebrities, but whenever he had a uh, civilian on, whenever he had, you know, the oldest lady in Iowa or somebody with a potato chip collection, mm -hmm. they would pre-interview him and then we'd write him a bunch of ad libs and he'd do them. And he, again, he would do them so effortlessly. You couldn't imagine he wasn't making them up. So that's what he was good. At. Yeah. He was good at stealing. Now, who did he <laughs> steal Karnak from? That was, uh, was that Steve Allen? Steve Allen did a thing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Do you remember a Karnak joke, a, a gag that you wrote? Um, I'm gonna, can I tell a story? Oh, sure. Yes. I'm like somebody's grandpa. No, no, we want you to keep quiet. I got a lot of stories. Yeah, the more, the longer I go, the less of you we yeah. got. And maybe it's for the best. And it's, uh, I, wrote, I wrote a Karnak. I won't even tell you the Karnak. It was so bad. But it was, because again, we had to write 60 of them a day, right? So, and I wish you just said write 10 good ones, but no, we'd write about 10, you know, 10 good ones and 50 crap, and he'd always pick the crap, and then he'd get mad. So he does the, well, I'll tell you the joke, just because it was awful, right? <laughs> I know it was bad. It was from the crap list, and it was, it was sort of, it was red square. What do you call that blotch on Gorbachev's head? Remember Gorbachev? Sure, yeah, yeah, Weinstein. Remember, yeah, yeah. Red, so, okay, yeah. red square. So he goes out. He does a red square. What do you call that blotch on blah, 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 And it bombs. And I mean, it bombs. <laughs> it's, and it's that old saying that it sucked the air out of the room. Right. Really, pe people right. were gasping for air. It was horrible how badly that went, right? So, and I see him looking around. Who do I fire? And, you know, <laughs> and, and of course, we had to write the savers, too. We had right. to write them the 10 jokes. So he could crap on our material, but we didn't <laughs> oh, work. Did you write the insult, too? Which where one? He would, where he would insult the audience for not laughing at the joke? Yes. Oh, yeah, the, yeah, yeah, we'd write 10. Yeah. Those were the savers. Uh -huh. You know, made the million man march stop at your daughter's bedroom and right. stuff like that. <laughs> so, so, all right, so he did it. It bombed. I, I almost got fired, except, you know, he didn't know who wrote anything. Six months later, he's doing Karnak again. <laughs> And I go down to the set, and I said, I'm looking at the cue cards, and by some clerical error, 
there's that joke again. It came back. Red Square. What's on Gorbachev's head? And I go, well, I'm fired now. And he comes on the air, blah, blah, blah. Red Square. He does the joke, and it killed. It killed. And I, I, it was a big moment where I just go, I give up. I give up. This isn't science. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense at all. It's great. Now, Ed McMahon. Yes. Alcoholic? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's a statement or a yes. question? Yeah, yes. well, I think it's both. It was, well, this is the other thing about yes. the Tonight Show. I wish, I, it's just, you never met these guys. I worked there a year and a half. That was at Carson for an hour. I never met Ed McMahon. I never met Doc Severin. about Pat McCormick? Was he there then? No, the legendary everybody Pat McCormick? the legendary Pat McCormick had been fired five times. I see. Just, they just loved to fire Pat McCormick, so I never met him. There was a guy named Mickey Rose there. Mickey Rose who wrote oh, sure. bananas oh, sure. and what take he, the money what he around. Yeah. And he, he was wondering when I told that story about getting fired because Mrs. Carson wanted more alimony, it was Mickey Rose. It was he and another. It's funny. They're both dead. He and a guy named Bill Daly got fired the same day. Uh, but Mickey Rose, they fired him that day, and Fred... It was Fred DeCorda, but that was his job, to fire people. And he, he was so great at it. He was so masterful. And he'd go, Fred would go, you're fired, and you go, thank you. He did it so well. And uh, when he fired Mickey, Mickey said to him, well, this is the third f time you fired me. I'm looking forward to the fourth. <laughs> now, I, I heard a, a weird... Pat McCormick story okay. about uh, each writer trying to outdo the other one's party. I don't know this. Oh, okay. Then we'll go on to the next topic. <laughs> Had to do with helicopters. Oh, okay. Yes, I've heard that story. Oh, can you you want to tell that story then? I just what I've heard is it was for one of his birthdays or something. Yes. They came with a helicopter with a hooker in it. Yeah, and they <laughs> the hooker. <laughs> <laughs> and that was it. They flew. I think they flew over his home where his wife and kids were, and he got blown in the yes, helicopter. That they would circle the well, house when his wife was home, and the hooker would blow the rider. In, in each, <laughs> they took turns. Oh, really? Okay, no, I hadn't yeah. heard. And and the funny thing is, I met Tim Conway. Yeah. And I said, "Look, I heard a story. It's probably not true. I don't know." <laughs> Uh, about Pat, and I don't even get the whole McCormick out, and Tim Conway goes, helicopter? <laughs> he used to do a thing. Again, I never met the guy. I heard he would, he would dress as a priest, <laughs> and he'd, get a, he'd rent a convertible, and he'd, he'd drive down the highway in the convertible with a woman dressed as a nun with no top on, and he'd wave and <laughs> Now, what about the you you met the guest on Carson show? No, 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 no. man. So it's... what the fuck do we have you here for? I... <laughs> <laughs> really had you guys isolated. That was it. Yeah, there, but there, I I was there a year and a half. I didn't even meet the monologue writers. I didn't meet them at all. And uh, and finally at lunch after after about a year, I meet one of the monologue writers, and he says. Uh, I'm just introducing myself. I said, yeah, my, my partner and I, we just got out of Harvard. And uh, later this gossip comes back where they said, Mike, your job's in trouble. Carson just hired two writers from Harvard. And I go, no, that's me. They just, <laughs> they're just hearing about it in the trailer. There was so, another weird thing. This is something, if you no. ever have a stalker, there was a guy... He He's, might. Yes. yes. <laughs> Every you hope and pray. <laughs> you have to tell random people. Yes. Stop following me. Yeah. If anyone's <laughs> out there, please stalk me. <laughs> but Carson had a stalker, and he didn't know what to do about it. And so finally, he hired the guy. <laughs> <laughs> to write monologue? He, no, no. No, a job he could hang on to. And he, 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 he just hired him to work in the... He was like a receptionist working Very in the front clever. office. It worked. I mean, smart. Yeah, it worked. The guy got unobsessed with Carson and became obsessed with Paul McCartney. And oh, <laughs> and, which was fine till the night Paul McCartney came on the show. 
<laughs> Speaking of Harvard, you mentioned Harvard, and I, yeah, I, yeah. I talk a little bit about about the Harvard Lampoon. And I read you met your wife at Harvard. You I met did. your writing partner at Harvard. Yes, and I yet did. you have nothing nice to say. I about have Harvard. nothing nice to say about the place. I, and, I, <laughs> yeah. I keep I write to Al Qaeda. I encourage it as a terror target. I think I got nothing good to say about it. I mean, and that was it. I. Uh, but your comedy career came out of there. And yes, started I mean, there. I. Uh, I went to Harvard to join the Harvard Lampoon just because they had a humor magazine. And I went there, and I mean, I hated Harvard. And the Lampoon wound up being a bunch of guys who hated Harvard and would just sit in this building all day and make jokes. And it was a great environment. And it was almost, it was like the closest thing you could find to comedy writer school, even though that wasn't the intent of it. And about half our Simpsons writers have come out of Harvard. Mm -hmm. And, uh, Jeff Martin and, and those guys. Yes. And uh, you, you describe it as being pretty cutthroat. No, that, that did room. I say that? Did I, I read that somewhere. Was, oh. it, was, it the, was it the Harvard Lampoon or the National Lampoon? No, neither. <laughs> National Lampoon, nobody was around. Harvard Lampoon, it was just fun and exciting. It was what you would see on, you know, a, a Neil Simon play about the Sid Caesar show. It was just everybody was funny and someone would make a joke and somebody would top it and run with it. And, you know, people in comedy are used to that, but... I'd never seen that before. I'd never seen people like that, where everybody was making each other funny and bringing out the best in each other. And uh, I like that. I met my wife through a freshman talent show. I was the MC of the freshman talent show, and I'm doing comedy. And there was one other comedian in the show, and he bombed. He bombed so bad. And at the end of the show, I said, look, you know, maybe comedy's not your thing. Stick to drama. And he went... <laughs> He went on to create the show House and made eight hundred million dollars. David Shore? No, it oh. was it was the, his boss, oh, Paul Adonazio. I, oh, I see. I have a worthless imitation Harvard diploma on my so wall. So do I. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Mine was. I think I was honored by Harvard. Is it, it real? It, Were you there? Did yeah, you go? I go? was at Harvard, and it was some weird thing. And naturally, somebody had just died, some beloved professor, and they said, so there's only about six people here to honor you. <laughs> Who brought uh, it? Was it the Harvard Lampoon or the Hasty Pudding? Uh, Harvard Lampoon. Oh, okay. Yeah. I think there's a poster of you up there. Oh, okay. So, <laughs> they remember so you. So at least it proves I was there, yeah. whether they were honoring me yeah, or not. Yeah. When I was there, I played, I was the president of Lampoon, and... I'd invite celebrities to come in, you know, and uh, I got close with Frank Sinatra. He didn't come, but he invited me to a concert, and he read my letter on stage. But I, as a prank, as a prank, I invited Charles Manson because I got, <laughs> all right, he's in jail for a while, but maybe someday he'll get out you know, 20 years from now, and he'll show up at the door of the Lampoon with this letter from me saying, you invited me, man. <laughs> I want my medal. <laughs> so you knew Frank Sinatra? I just, that was it. I just, I got his address from somewhere. <laughs> I wrote to a bunch of people. That was it. The other, I heard from Frank and got sn snubbed by Manson. So, so those were... <laughs> Uh, so, you you were friends with Sinatra and Charles Manson. That's correct. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Trace the history of this a little bit for us. We would uh, all go to Mike, Jason's. You, you, yes, went, you went from the, the Harvard Lampoon to the National Lampoon. Correct. And, oh. and then eventually out to Hollywood. Yes, I, I was working. It was my whole life dream. I'm sorry. I, have, I just can't imagine anyone is interested in me. <laughs> I don't know who. I was going to say, this is like your Or fifth, us, for that matter. Yes. This is your fifth podcast. And that's and the end of our podcast to today. <laughs> I can talk all night. Yeah. I know nobody's listening. I've been, These mics aren't even on. Yeah. <laughs> Mine's licorice. And uh, I've been on five podcasts now, and I'm nobody. Nobody's ever fucking heard of me. This is my fifth podcast, and not only do I do them, but nobody's ever come up to me later and go, hey, I heard you on that podcast. <laughs> wow. And so, they they um, always get you on podcasts saying how many people are listening to that yeah. podcast, <laughs> and, and it's the greatest press you can get. <laughs> That's it. I, I assume I'm getting a big check for this. Yeah. <laughs> I just, Absolutely. I presume. We have I a mean, painting of, a pastel of Gilbert we'd like you yes. to have. 
So I forget what I was saying. Oh, so this is the career of Mike Reese. Everybody wants to hear about. <laughs> yeah, it was at Harvard Lampoon, and somebody at National Lampoon read my articles. They they had subscribers there, and that was my lifetime dream to go to the, work at National Lampoon. And I got hired right out of college, and the magazine was in serious decline. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, <laughs> And there I was. Mm -hmm. That's around the time Gilbert was there. Yes. When oh, the yeah. yeah. Was... Right when it was yeah. spinning around but the drain. Yeah. I loved it. It was yeah. the nicest job. And you can't, it was like, I, 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 could, I had to get out of there because someone said, it's going to fold any day yeah. now. <laughs> I, I wrote letters. Oh, I used you to did. write the letters. I was the letters editor. When really? were you doing Which it? Which under George Barkin and Larry Doyle. Oh, okay. The oh, very Larry. last incarnation before the padlock came That's out. That's it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I love the job, but I left because they said they were going to shut down any minute now. And they went another eight years. I would have hung yeah. in there. I yeah. never had. I was a there at the very, job. very end when Drew Friedman was oh, the art cartoon yes, editor. Yes, I used to have. I used to have fun. Yeah. Uh, did you do photo him. funnies? And I, yeah, did I did photo yeah. funnies. I did. I mean, it was it was pretty shameless. <laughs> I I would write these photo funnies that would just get like uh, naked girls to uh, be in a shot with me. Right. And and I would write them and. After a while, it was like I was rewriting the same thing over and over <laughs> again. And I just had my picture take with naked girls, and they'd say, isn't this the same exact thing you submitted last month? And I'd say, no, no, it's, it's really subtly different. <laughs> and I wrote some letters for them, too. Oh, yeah. yeah. We That's didn't know right. each other then, strangely enough. We were both writing letters yes. for the Lampoon. Yes. You know who else used to write was David Mamet. I was the letters editor. I was 21, wow. editing letters, and David Mamet would send in funny letters, and they weren't that funny. <laughs> <laughs> He's a hilarious guy. I know. Yeah. <laughs> and they, and they would, the boss would always say, just buy it. You know, it's David Mamet. And, so that was he got it. The 20, it was 25 bucks a letter. I got about 75 bucks of unearned pay. Went to David Mamet. I saw, I'll tell you a David Mamet sure. letter. He goes, <laughs> okay. He'll love hearing this. This is what he'll He's not him. listening. <laughs> you told me he was listening. Yes. So, That's he, how we got you on the podcast. He said, why? I think this, why are children in, in China starving? Because children are small and they have to sit on phone books to reach the dinner table. And the phone books are very small in China because nobody has phones. Uh, <laughs> Sir oh, David Mamet, no. yes. 25 bucks. <laughs> like American Buffalo. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Well, we're just curious about the Hollywood history. I mean, what was the, for, trying to get to Alf and the, it's Gary Shandling yes. show and eventually to the Simpsons and the critics. So yes, I, did, uh, what was the jump from the Lampoon? The jump was there was a guy, I got a call from Hollywood uh, from a guy who needed jokes. They were making the movie Airplane 2. Airplane Two. It was a it was a hilarious oh. comedy about the space shuttle blowing up <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> with William Shatner. Yes, yes, William Shatner. And I got it. It was a, a dream come true. And we, my Al Jean and I, we quit our job on a day's notice. We just quit. We moved out to Hollywood. We left everything behind in New York to work on Airplane Two. And I mean, it was exciting. We met all the all the celebrities on the movie and. Uh, Sonny Bono took a shine to us. He, he, <laughs> oh, yes. Sonny Bono was the mad bomber. San, yeah. Sonny Bono. Wow, right. you saw the film. I did. So, uh, Were the Zuckers involved with that one? or was no, it, they, no. In fact, <laughs> they took out an ad saying, we are not involved in Airplane 2. <laughs> right. and, then, uh, and then their next movie was Top Secret, which right. is a funny movie, but a complete flop. And so we were going to take out an ad saying, and we're not involved in Top Secret. <laughs> I remember, I, I think it was Julie Haggerty when I worked with her, and she said that the Sucker Brothers were telling the cast of the original airplane not to be an airplane, too. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. Well, they didn't listen. <laughs> no, we, we, they, uh, who was it? Leslie I Nielsen think, was not in the movie. I think Peter Graves. Peter or, Graves came in. Right, he was hilarious. right. right. Uh, I'm trying to remember. Lloyd Bridges came Lloyd in. Bridges. He was a pet. Yeah, it's funny. I, I have more good stories about Airplane too. Lloyd Bridges, stubborn old coot, <laughs> wouldn't do the jokes, had his own gags he wanted to oh, do. Oh, no. Oh, gosh. And oh. Uh, 
And that was it. And he's like, he was like 87 years old, and he almost got in a fist fight with the director. And I think he would have won. I mean, he was just this <laughs> big, vigorous man. Now, what were some of Lloyd Bridges' jokes that he came in with? He wanted to come in senile, and he wanted to come in shaving, and then talk into his electric razor like it was a phone, and <laughs> then it was a barbell. It was this. this this long chaplain esque bit. I don't know. It was mighty bad. And uh, yeah, he was there. And uh, shoot. I was know. Robert Stack in that one too? Robert Stack yeah, was there. Yeah. He was very funny. Yeah. Chad Everett was in the movie. Did Chad, Chad Everett yeah. just died? He died a while ago, a couple okay. years ago. Okay, but I know he's doing the podcast. Yeah. Yes. yeah. So, that's not going to stop us. <laughs> so. So we every we we have a list of names that we have to cross off names every day. <laughs> He's not kidding. He was, I was so excited he had Marty Allen on the show. Yeah, we did. I'm sure he's been dead for 20 years. I'm sure it's just, that's what a trooper the guy is. He had he a phone it. in his coffin. <laughs> and he clawed his way out of the ground. And Raymond Burr. Raymond Burr was in the movie, yes. And he was, and Raymond Burr, we, we all know now, is gay. He was yeah. gay. He was gay. <laughs> and I, I mean, God bless him. He's so funny in the movie. Again, playing just utter seriously. And as soon as they go, cut. Oh, my God, he was Tiny Tim. He was, <laughs> he was, <laughs> it was so great to see, you know. And I think he played a judge. And we go, all right, uh, case dismissed. Cut. Was that good? Could I do it again? I can see, <laughs> see, I heard stories about Raymond Burr, someone who was working with him on either Perry Mason or uh, Ironside, and the same stories I've heard about this soldier, I mean a general, who was uh, an advisor on uh, Gomer Pyle, uh, you know, whatever. That, USMC. Yes. Yeah. And he, they said, like, after by the end of the day with both of them, they could hold the, they could butch it up. Yeah. And then they get tired and drunk and then become just flamers. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you get from Airplane 2, Mike, into uh, working on some of the great television shows? Uh, let me see. I know we, we're working on, we're thinking Airplane 2, this is going to be a hit, and can we, you know, wait for Hollywood? And uh -huh. then we also got assigned to write uh, a Vietnam comedy. Now, that sounds like wow. nothing now, but in 1981, <laughs> nobody even talked about Vietnam. I mean, there was maybe the deer hunter, and here we were. It was, a, it was our, our director, who was a Canadian communist, said, we're going to write a movie about Vietnam called Cowards. And <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. And, that was, and we wrote this thing and it just killed us. It killed us so dead. All right, I do have a good story about this. Yeah. So we wrote Cowards. It killed our career. Nobody read it. And, uh, and I'm in LA and I hated it. I hated LA every day. I lived there for 26 years. And uh, the only thing that got me through the week was pre computers, pre DVDs, and tapes or anything. You just had to watch TV. And the only thing that got me through the week was watching this show, 9 to 5. It was a sitcom based on uh, the Oh, movie. I wow. think Sandra Bullock. Was she in, was, did she play the Jane Fonda part? No, well, this is another one. It went through many incarnations. Oh, okay. So, so when I was there, it was Rita Moreno wow. and Dolly Parton, his cousin. Oh. And, <laughs> I have no recollection of this show. No, and Valerie Curtin was on it, but, wow. not, but I was there in the... So anyway... I'm watching the show. It was the worst show I ever saw in my life. And I mean, I would drink a beer and sort of toast it, you know, to horrible comedy. It was the worst show I ever saw. And then one day I get a call. Uh, Nine to five wants to meet with you. They, they read Cowards and they love it. So, and I went in. I said, yes, I watch your show every week. I love how the little boy lives on a shelf over the sink and they sell <laughs> knife holders for a living. And they go... We've never interviewed anyone who's seen our show before. <laughs> and I got, that was it. I got hired on that. And it was, it was the worst. I couldn't believe it, how bad the show was week after week. And then I got fired. I got fired off the worst show in wow. TV That was history. you by yourself or you and Al? It's always partner. me and Al. You and Al. It's always yeah. me and Al. And so we got fired off of that. And then we got 
I don't know. Then we got a series of jobs. Then we worked on a show called Sledgehammer, which has a nice. Oh, was Gilbert cult. and I were talking about? Yeah, Sledgehammer. he was. Kind of, I forget his name, not actor. David uh, Raji. David oh, Rushy. I think yes. you met him with me. Funny yeah, I show. see him yes, all the time. Yes. Funny and show. He's yeah. He was. He's kind of like a takeoff on Clint Eastwood movies. Correct. Yeah, it was a funny show. People loved it. Uh, it had a little. It's got a nice cult following, and uh, that went off. And then I worked. And it's Gary Shandling show, and uh, and I worked there for a couple of years, and then The Simpsons came along. And now, uh, if if we could jump back to Airplane Two, for okay. just a second. <laughs> yes. What I remember mostly about that movie is it seemed like it was seventy five percent just repeating jokes from Airplane that One. That is correct. <laughs> And it's really give the people what they want, right? <laughs> that was, it was funny. I mean, they've done it more now, but I mean, that was a movie of jokes. Airplane One yeah. was just about jokes. There weren't characters exactly. It was jokes, and so they go, "Let's make a sequel to it." And you know, usually a sequel. Let's continue with these characters. Let's continue this story. But this was just a joke movie, so they said, "Let's do those jokes again." And, yeah, <laughs> and that's what we did. Included. I mean, they were just. Kind of, they didn't know what to do, and you realize they don't do that anymore. They don't make. There's, there wasn't a sequel to Animal House. They don't make a lot of comedy sequels. They did. They did try Caddyshack too. Yes, they yeah. did. Oh uh, boy, yeah. Yes. With Robert. Speaking of Robert Stack. Yeah. Oh really? Yeah, he's in, he's that? in that. Yes. Yeah. And and Sadly. it was a, yeah. It was originally supposed to be Rodney Dangerfield and Sam Kinison, and they got uh, Jackie Mason and Randy Quaid. <laughs> <laughs> Close. <laughs> And I remember Randy Quaid doing these entire monologues that were obviously written for Sam Kinison. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about its Gary Shandling show, which was a, an influential show. Yeah. Uh, and, and groundbreaking in its way. It was a nice job. It was a nice... <laughs> and I mean, people don't realize sort of how much of The Simpsons came out of there. I would say, I think, 11 writers from that show, including Sam Simon, mm -hmm. first worked on that show. And a lot of things that The Simpsons are known for, we did on Gary Shandling's show, uh, including, like, doing a whole episode parody. You didn't do a parody scene. The whole episode was a ripoff of some movie. We did The Graduate. Or you do a like musical. That. Or we yeah. do a musical, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was an inventive show. Yes, and it was it was very, very hard work. It was... And, the other funny thing is, we're working on that show, and it was 80, 90 hours a week. It was brutal. Wow. wow. Very brutally hard job, but fun. And, uh, and then we were on summer break, and Alan Zweibel, who was running the show, was doing a show called The Boys on Showtime. Oh, I remember that show. Oh, oh was that with the old comics? Old yes. comics. Yeah, like Norman Fell was Norman on. Norman Fell remember that and show. Jackie Gale. Wow. And that was and. Oh, Al, Jean, and I, we would have killed to work on The Boys. And, <laughs> and for whatever reason, we weren't good enough to work on The Boys, so we had to take our second choice, which was The Simpsons. And the Simpsons, <laughs> the Simpsons was just starting up, and nobody wanted to work on it. Nobody wanted to work on it because it was a cartoon, and there hadn't been a cartoon in prime time in 30 years. Right. And it was on the Fox Network, and nobody knew if the Fox Network was going to be there from week to week. So... This this is 89. This is the origi original yeah, staff, right? Probably 88. 88. We were, we're, we're working out of a trailer. We didn't even have a real office. And that was when The Simpsons looked really creepy. Yes, they, they looked awfully weird. It's very funny in that <laughs> I used to see those. I mean, they got the whole series off those one-minute Simpson shorts, and everybody loved them, and they were, you know, the height of cartoon sophistication and that kind of thing. I loved them. And... You can't see them anywhere now. And the reason you can't see them is they're terrible. Oh, yeah. They look bad. Yeah, they're not they're funny. The voices are wrong. Right. But, you know, at the time, they seem really great. Wasn't Castellaneta sort of doing Walter Matthau? He was doing... The, yeah. 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 Hard, yeah. hard. <laughs> hard to watch. <laughs> they were great at the time because right. you had nothing to compare them to. Right. Hard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so, he said there was no dances... There's no emotional range in Walter Matthau. Homer's yeah. always ex <laughs> Homer's excited when popcorn yeah. pops, and uh, right, right. so he come he, here, boys. <laughs> <laughs> There's so many things wrong. I can tell you about the early Simpsons. There's, I'll give you. <laughs> these are dark secrets <laughs> that I can tell here, and they will remain dark secrets. 
Don't but, worry, no one's listening to this podcast. <laughs> Including the people yeah. that were in the room when we started. <laughs> but when, uh, here's two secrets of The Simpsons. One is, uh, Marge has tall hair. Do you know why? You seem to know a bunch of things. You got me stumped on that one. Marge has tall hair because Matt Groening said in the last episode she's going to take off her hair and we'll see she has long rabbit ears. And because Matt Groening used to write a oh, cartoon. The big, about oh, rabbit. that's right. Like, like yes. So, yeah. Wow. So Marge has rabbit ears. That how was one of his how ideas. How strange. Now you got, I'm, I'm not making fun of Matt. We didn't right. know anyone was going to watch. So. Sure. That was as good as anything. Yeah, Marge. <laughs> Here's our last episode. Marge is a rabbit. Okay. Thanks for watching. You thought the last Seinfeld was bad. God, I, I remember that was they used to have it in uh, like the Village Voice. Right. Sure. Well, that. wasn't that what, what drew James Brooks to, 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 to Matt when yes. he was looking for somebody to do the interstitials for the Tracy Ullman That's show? That's it. They had these interstitials and... Uh, it's a famous story. I'll tell the story. It's not my story, but it was. They brought Matt Groening in for a meeting, and it was one of those things. I'm sure you've had these where the agent said, "It's just a hello. It's a meet and greet." Oh yes. Yeah. <laughs> and he, he goes in, and five minutes before the meeting, they come out and said, "Gee, we're very excited about your new project. We can't wait to see what you brought for us." And he didn't know. He had nothing. So in five minutes, he drew the Simpsons and. Based on his family. Based on his family. Yeah. His, mo his father's name Homer, and his mother is Marge, and his sisters are Lisa and Maggie. And uh, five minutes work. Think if he put an hour into it, how good the show would be. Right. It's incredible. See, but here's something really weird. In um, Day of the Locust, I never read the book, but in the movie, Donald Sutherland's name is Homer Simpson. Yeah, we really <laughs> wrecked that in the film. <laughs> how strange. <laughs> yeah, that was, uh, yes, that novella clearly is less popular than your podcast. Yeah. You're, you're, you're the first one to ever say it was a classic novel, Day of the Locust, and Matt Groening, when he was a teenager, read the, and in, he, the main character was named Homer Simpson. He goes, oh, that's a funny name, and plus the fact that his own father is named Homer. He said, all right, if I ever do a show, I'll use the name Homer Simpson. Yeah, I would love to see yeah. the movie again. It must look ludicrous. It, it, it looks... It's ridiculous now. Is Karen Black in it, that picture? Oh, yeah, the yeah. Day of the Locust. It's yeah. very dramatic. There's a part where a mob attacks him and tears him apart. And and meanwhile, they keep calling him Homer Simpson, yeah. which would, <laughs> would be like doing a drama and saying, the lead character's Mickey Mouse. <laughs> <laughs> the lead character is Bugs Bunny. <laughs> And the murderer is. <laughs> you guys You guys were in the Fox lot on what? You were saying in a trailer or a... When yeah, it was we were in a, a little trailer. I, I visited Jay and Wally in, in one of those... One, I think it was the early season. Maybe, maybe season two. Oh, so all I, right. I saw, saw the working conditions. Oh. It, didn't, it didn't look so bad. No, we were out of the trailer by season two. But season one... And the, the story I always tell is we're sitting there. It was just a summer job. Uh -huh. I'm working on Gary Shandling's show, which was literally the lowest rated show on TV. <laughs> And my summer job is inventing The Simpsons. And we're sitting in the room. And I said, how long do you think The Simpsons is going to last? And everybody in the room, Jay and Wally, everyone said the same thing. Six weeks. Six weeks, six weeks. Nobody thought it would go longer than six weeks. And somebody, maybe Sam Simon goes, I think it could make it to 13 weeks. But don't worry. No one's going to watch it. It won't hurt <laughs> your career. Incredible. Now, what are some of the ways that the Simpson characters have changed over the years? Uh, let me think. Like, I wrote, oh, let me, I'll tell you my one more <laughs> Simpsons uh, secret, just because it, oh, okay. it'll lead into that. This is Matt Groening's big idea. <laughs> In the last episode, we were going to find out that Homer is Krusty the Clown. That, Interesting. That was, and if you if you ever see like a line drawing, a black and white drawing of Krusty without where you can't see the color and the makeup, he looks exactly sure. like Homer. And that was Matt's idea. Oh, <laughs> it'll be a great reveal because Bart loves Krusty and hates Homer. And in the last episode, he'll find out they're the same guy. <laughs> so, <laughs> episode six, we've got a scene with Homer talking to Krusty the Clown. It's like <laughs> that went out the window. <laughs> But in, in response to Gilbert's question, yes. I think that the, the most the, the most profound change seemed to be that Smithers changed races. Yes, Smithers was black. Oh, I got a good joke. Everybody, Smithers was yeah. black. Yeah. The first yeah. season, the first one. Smithers first was black, and it was when we saw the shows in color. We said, 
gee, this doesn't look right. We got one black character and he's kissing up to his mean old white boss. And so we just went, poof, he's white. Poof, he's gay. This is how God does it, too. And, and no mention at all that Never. the day before he was black no. so and straight. No. So Smithers is the first man in history to go from black and straight to white and gay. The second was Michael Jackson. Right. Who also appeared on the show. Who also appeared on the show. Now, with Michael Jackson, isn't that that he did this? He recorded the dialogue, but the song was somebody else? Correct. Yes. Yeah. Michael Jackson and... I wrote this with Al Jean and I wrote the script for Michael Jackson where he played a 200 pound white mental patient who thought he was Michael Jackson and uh, and it, Michael Jackson wrote an original song for the episode and at rehearsals it was funny we went to Sandy Gallon's house the, the major talent manager I guess yeah, Dolly Parton's manager yeah, and, yeah, Dolly famous, Parton again famous yeah, so, manager so he we go to his house and he said something I'd never heard he goes he says, I haven't been in every room in my house. <laughs> That's how big his house was. And so we're doing a, a table reading of the script just to hear it. And uh, and so I'm sitting right next to Michael Jackson, and he's singing, he's singing the songs we've written into the show. He's singing Thriller and Bad. He's singing all his songs. Uh, ben, he's wow. six feet away from me. It was unbelievable. So then we get to record the show. We bring him into the studio. I'll tell all of this stuff. So uh, his manager, I guess Sandy Gallon calls. He goes, here's what Michael needs. He needs a trailer. It's got to be heated to 90 degrees. It's got to have four kinds of water in there and raw peas. It was just as long. <laughs> what a writer. Writer thinks we had to do for him. And then Michael Jackson shows up that day. He doesn't go anywhere near the trailer. Didn't have an entourage. He came solo. Came alone. He looked really handsome. That was about... Six noses before death. He he looked pretty good. His tall, strapping guy shook everybody's hand. Couldn't have been nicer, more affable. And uh, we're recording him. He's acting. He's terrible. The guy couldn't act at all. <laughs> <laughs> but we go, all right, well, wait till he sings. You know, this is why we hired the guy. He's going to sing. And they go, and we get to that moment. He goes, one second, please. And he he motions, and this little white guy comes in. <laughs> And we're going, who the hell is this? And he goes, this is Kip Lennon. He's my uh, official sound alike. And Kip Lennon, he's the brother of the Lennon sisters. Wow. If that means it. Wow. <laughs> wow. That gets one wow. <laughs> okay, to remember wow. The Lennon yeah. That'll be the second. But that was it. Kip did all the singing in that episode while Michael Jackson's standing two feet away laughing like this is wonderful. <laughs> and Kip is, if you ever watch the show again, you'll see... It's actually a parody of Michael Jackson. His kip is sort of just to make Michael Jackson laugh. He's doing a over-the-top Michael Jackson impression. And we, we go to Michael Jackson. We go, why are you doing this? <laughs> and he said, it's a joke on my brothers. And we go, all right, well, as long as you got a good reason. So the song, the Lisa, It's Your Birthday, isn't being sung by Michael Jackson. No, it is not. It's sung by not Kip Lennon. Interesting. <laughs> it's sung by Kip Lennon. It's written by Michael Jackson. In the credits, it says it's written by Brian Golden. We don't know who the hell that guy is. <laughs> <laughs> and how did some of the other characters change? The characters yeah. changed. Uh, I'll give you a good example. It's Groundskeeper Willie. Groundskeeper Willie appeared in the script he had two lines it was in act one he goes you'll be back and in act three he goes i told you you'd be back so <laughs> so we're recording the show it's the last two lines of the day and dan castellanet is at the mic and he says who is this guy and we said i don't know give him an accent and so he did him spanish and we go nah that sounds racist <laughs> so he says Whatever, I'll do him Scottish. And he did it, you'll be back. I told you, you'll be back. And that was it. We go, all right, that's a wrap. So four seconds of thought went into making groundskeeper <laughs> Willie Scottish. He's now a national hero in Scotland. <laughs> <laughs> they love him in Scotland. And in one episode, we said groundskeeper Willie's from Aberdeen. And in another episode, we said he's from Glasgow. And why do we do that? Because we don't give a shit, right? <laughs> But, but the people in Aberdeen and Glasgow, they care deeply about this. And whenever they play each other in soccer, a riot breaks out. 
And you go, what are they fighting about? It's like, hey, you know that alcoholic cartoon janitor who, <laughs> who lives in a shack, <laughs> lives in a shack full of kitty porn? <laughs> He's from my town. Did, did you and Al write the wonderful groundskeeper Willie line uh, bo- uh, where he calls the, he's teaching the, uh, he's the substitute French teacher? And he walks in the room and calls the kids cheese eating surrender monkeys. Now there was. <laughs> <laughs> That's a joke. There were three people in the room. I mean, usually we write The Simpsons with 10 people, 12 people in the room. That day it was me, Al Jean, and a guy named Ken Keeler. One of us wrote that joke. None of us remember oh, it because. It's a great line. It is not a great line. <laughs> it's, it's Mad Libs. It's not at all great. <laughs> Now, I heard The Simpsons is recorded like an old radio show. Yeah, it used to be. In yeah. the old days, we would record, we'd have them all there. You know, we get everybody at a table, and they read the script out loud, and it's an amazing thing to watch. You should come. <laughs> since, you never, since that's the only way you'll ever see it. <laughs> but... Yeah, we get it. And so it's an amazing thing to watch because you got six people doing sometimes 120 characters. And like Harry Shearer does Burns and Smithers, and he just sits there talking to himself. It's an amazing, and he never slips up, never makes a mistake. Now, now, now uh, Paul Schaefer said to me, yeah. he goes, you know, you know Harry, Harry Shearer, Harry Shearer hates you. <laughs> he, he hates you, Gallery. He really hates you. <laughs> And because I, I did some joke on my short-lived season of Saturday Night Live <laughs> that was referring to Harry Shearer <laughs> that I didn't even write. <laughs> but they go, no, he, he can't stand you. He hates you. <laughs> Harry can hold a grudge. <laughs> what They're was just... the line? You were describing yourself? You had to describe yeah, the new cast members? Uh, yes. Each, it was supposed to be like, each, it was a whole new cast. So each one of us was getting up and going like, you know, Piscopo would say, I'm Joe Piscopo. I'm kind of like a cross between Dan Aykroyd and so-and-so. And someone else would say, I'm like Gilda Radner. And my line was, uh, I'm Gilbert Gottfried. I'm kind of a cross between uh, John Belushi and that guy on the show that did imitations who no one remembers anymore. Wow. So you- <laughs> yeah. And for some reason, Harry Shearer took that as an insult. Wow. <laughs> he went, it could have been somebody else. Yes, <laughs> yes. He, he hates you. Wow. So how has that affected your life? <laughs> well, well, whenever uh, Harry Shearer is producing a major motion picture, <laughs> he never has me in any of the starring roles. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> what other characters did you and Al have a hand in creating? We, Mike? again, it because was, it was such a, I know it was a free for all in those days. Yeah, and, how half assed, like, groundskeeper Willie was. And it was right. like Al and I, with Matt Groening and Sam Simon, wrote like episode six where Bart cuts the head off the statue of Jebediah Springfield. I'm looking at Gilbert. I can see he never watches the show. No, he's a fan. We've talked about it. Never. We've talked about it many times. No, it's just when you talk I get distracted. (laughs) sort of zones out. Oh, gee. I start going, ah, I thought the table was an inch over to the left. (laughs) Gee, taxes are only ten months away. Yeah, so. I like pizza. So, in that episode, one episode we did, uh, that's the in- episode that introduced Jimbo, Dolph, Kearney, uh, the three bullies, uh-huh. plus Nelson. We had a fourth bully. Why do we need four bullies? So we, the four bullies, uh, Chief Wiggum, Eddie, and Lou, they all came in in that episode. And Apu came in that show. And Apu, when we're writing it, I remember very clearly going, all he had to say was 35 cents, please. And uh, I remember saying... Let's not make him an Indian. That's such a cliche. We're better than that. So <laughs> Obviously, you weren't. <laughs> That's it. Yes. And that was it. The clerk's line was, 35 cents, please. And underneath, in boldface, capital letters, he is not an Indian. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't take it. That was it. We get to the reading, and Hank goes, 35 cents, please. And it got this giant laugh. And that's when we learned, oh, Hank doesn't read stage directions. <laughs> 
Uh, Gilbert and I were talking, speaking of the old lampoon, was itchy and scratchy, you know where I'm going with this one, was itchy and scratchy an homage uh, to uh, Kit and Caboodle? No. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> is, is homage French for theft? It's a... <laughs> I was trying to be delicate. Yes. Uh, I don't know. I mean, they were in the shorts. They what, were... Why are you doing a Johnny Carson? <laughs> that, I'll give it to Mac Raining. I don't know where his inspiration came from or if he even... He always says... It's a, it's, everyone thinks it's Tom and Jerry. Right. It's not Tom and Jerry. He's a, he says it's a parody of Herman, Herman and Catnip. Oh, oh yeah. The old Terry yeah. Toons rip off of Tom and Jerry where they... They really were worse than Itchy and Scratchy. If you ever see these old, horribly animated cartoons, they're so <laughs> violent. Uh, he says that one, that's what it is. But then, you know, uh, about a year ago, I'm in, oh, it, was, it may have been at that event. You saw me at, I, yeah. I meet Brian McConaughey, the old National Lampoon writer who wrote Kitten Caboodle, which was Itchy and Scratchy in comic book form. 15 years before The Simpsons. I go, gee, are you ever mad about that? Have you ever noticed that? And he said, he said, gee, if you gave me, if you let me write a Simpsons script, I won't ever mention it again. And <laughs> so he did. He wrote an episode of The Simpsons. He's our first 70-year-old writer. He wrote a really funny episode. That was it. And we're I, off the hook. I heard Chuck Jones, I read this recently, created the Roadrunner and uh, what's his uh, character, his nemesis, uh, what? Wiley Coyote. Coyote. He created them. The first one he did was just a takeoff. He considered it a takeoff on Tom and Jerry because he thought Tom and Jerry was the worst cartoon <laughs> on the air. And then it became wildly successful by accident. Wow. <laughs> you know what? I heard a good one, too. Scooby-Doo. Do you know what Scooby-Doo was taken from? It's... It's the Dobie Gillis show. And really? They, and they said, let's do Do. I mean, they said, let's do Dobie Gillis. We'll have him solving mysteries with the dog. But it's character for character. Shaggy is Maynard G. Krebs? Shaggy is Maynard. And there's there's the Warren Beatty guy. You, and uh, you're scaring Tuesday me, Well. Wow. So, yeah. So, you know, sometimes you can rip off something so well. Well, Hanna-Barbera made an art form. Right. Uh, oh, yeah. The Honeymooners. No. You know who Yogi Bear is? Uh, well, I know it's like uh, Ed Norton. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Hey, boo boo. Yeah. And Huckleberry yeah. Hound was a little bit of old Andy Griffith. Correct. Was it they, not? they all did. Back then, you could just do celebrity impersonations for every cartoon character. Right. And we still kind of do. Yeah, oh, yeah. It's, well, Wiggins is an Edward G. Robinson. That's correct. It's, <laughs> Hank Azaria always says all his characters are terrible imitations. And, <laughs> And so Wiggum is as close as you get. Uh, Wiggum is Edward G. Robinson, but if you know Lou, the black cop who works with, with Wiggum, that's, uh, that's supposed to be Sylvester Stallone. <laughs> wow. And Mo, or people know Mo the bartender. Mo. Al Pacino. It's Pacino. I heard it's a terrible Al Pacino. <laughs> yeah, I never knew that. That was great. <laughs> and... and there's also the professor who's... Uh, oh, that's just Jerry. Yeah, Jerry oh, Lewis. Yeah, Frank. nutty professor. <laughs> you know, when we were watching old cartoons when I was a kid. I'd watch tons of cartoons, and they were always... They were doing the same thing, you know? Here's... Then we'll do this, this, this crow is Fats Waller. <laughs> you know, you're a kid in the 60s going, oh, Fats Waller, isn't that great? <laughs> it was all... I mean, I guess you can do it. I remember in the Dick Tracy cartoons, yeah. he would go to his characters. It would be Dick Tracy, and then he'd get these talking animal characters. <laughs> that were the cops. And one would be, Go in, go, Dick Tracy, get throw down, he throw that way, sir. <laughs> They got into trouble for some of those Dick Tracy characters, too. Oh, there yeah. was Joe Jitsu, was oh, sort of a racist yes. character. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it was an Irish cop. It was a little borderline. Oh, I have a story. Can I tell a story? Please. I, I sure. A, no, no, you can't tell I can't any tell stories. Story. I, can't. I have a Christmas special coming up. I wrote a children's book called How Murray Saved Christmas. It's going to be an NBC animated special in December. And, uh, so we got Jerry Stiller as the lead and Jason Alexander. And then I got a bunch of just great, versatile animation voices to do the other 50 characters in the thing. And we get to the, we had Tom Kenny, SpongeBob is in there. And 
he's supposed to do the voice of the Thanksgiving turkey. And again, we go, he goes, who is he? I go, I don't know. Think and he's trying things and he goes, wait, I'll do Gilbert. <laughs> <laughs> So I go, yeah, Gilbert. Now, do you know Tom Kenny? Uh, no. Okay. Well, I worked with Tom. But, but at least I made a check for him. <laughs> that was it. So he goes, we'll do Gilbert. And he does. And I go, I'm thinking, gee, I know Gilbert. I don't know if this is kosher. And I could have had Gilbert, but I didn't want Gilbert. And, and uh, so I would never have used it, except he did it. And it's, it sounded like Ethel Merman. <laughs> It is so funny. Well, that voice, that a day? That's, that's his Gilbert impression. Well, I, I was showing Gilbert Queer Duck before oh, you good. got here, and we were enjoying the Paul Lind. Yes. <laughs> and was but, it Bipolar Bear? Correct. Yeah. And that is Billy West. Yeah. We, 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 yeah. yeah. Well, but in, in all fairness, uh, sometimes I just break into, there's no business like show business. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. Well, I think we've run out of things to ask you about. That's it. I'm yeah. completely <laughs> Before we let you go, what are you doing My now? My mother is terribly sick. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you needed well, something. Well, I, 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 I hope it's a quick death. Thank you. <laughs> You're working on more children's books? You've done 17 children's done books? 17. And you have no children. I which have we no find children, yes. Uh, is this because you can't get an erection? That is. Yeah, okay. <laughs> All right. Could wow, you, suddenly could, we could go another hour. Do you have a <laughs> funny story about that? <laughs> can, I tell, can I tell a story about my impotence? <laughs> it also involves Paul Lind. And so, <laughs> oh, so. Mike. <laughs> that was, I wrote that character, Bipolar Bear. Everyone should watch Queer Duck. It's I great. like that better than it's anything great. I've worked on. <laughs> and, it's and all on, I, on YouTube. Look up Queer Duck. It's and, great. And Hard Drink and Lincoln. Oh, good. Another, yeah, really I like funny. it too. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so, but I wrote this Paul Lynn character. And you can do that when they're dead. That's the yeah. law. So <laughs> we're really, we, we're hoping you die before December. <laughs> And we're out of... Well, you're in with a large group of people. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, on the podcast, we had Bela Lugosi Jr., okay. who is a lawyer right. for people who uh, whose voices and images have been used over the years, like Karloff and the Stooges. And he he's a lawyer, so he fights too. He fights that now. I know that's his job. And he, you, did you meet? You had him on. You met him? Uh, yeah, no, 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 never met him. He was on the phone going, "Hey, I'm a lawyer. <laughs> I fight in court." <laughs> <laughs> I fight to win the rights of the three stooges. <laughs> It actually wasn't that entertaining. No. <laughs> Truth be told. <laughs> okay. Okay. So this. <laughs> I know I got to make room for a much bigger celebrity. <laughs> Larry Fine Jr. is coming in. We can't get him. Cream Ali Fine. The, the next door neighbor of Curly Joe Dorita. <laughs> <laughs> when is Murray, well, you, let's give you a plug, Mike. When is yeah. Murray uh, Saves Christmas? <laughs> it's on the <laughs> first couple of weeks of December. Okay, good. On NBC. On NBC. Good. So, we've been talking to Mike <laughs> Reese, a man who's never hired me, but has worked on The Simpsons for like, 2,000 years <laughs> and will go out of his way. He swore he'll go to his grave without hiring me for anything he ever works on and was a writer for the Johnny Carson show. And uh, you got no ending. I'll yeah, no ending. Well, we never do. Okay. Yeah, no. I'll tell you how so, I met okay. Gilbert and that'll be the end. <laughs> okay, let's hear it. <laughs> Even. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> or it's my show now. <laughs> Go ahead. So thank you for coming. So all right. <laughs> do your Ethel Merman. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so 
I, when we lived in L.A., we used to throw Christmas parties, and we'd invite 200 people, and 300 people would show up, and we'd always get one celebrity. And I mean, it wasn't George Clooney, but we'd get weird. <laughs> Craig Bierko. <laughs> you know, someone weird, Al Yankovic, uh-huh. showed up one year. So one day, I turn around, there's Gilbert Godfrey, <laughs> uninvited. Sounds right. In that my home, right. and I, I say to him, he's eating my food, he's drinking my liquor. I said, Gil- Gilbert, welcome. I'm a huge fan. Thanks for coming to my home. And he goes, you look like that gay man. And I go, what? <laughs> you look like that gay man who always plays gay men in the movies. <laughs> As he spits my food back on me. It's been 17 years. Who's that man? Who's that gay man? But you look just I like know. him. <laughs> so we've been talking to Mike Reese, who looks like that gay man who plays gay men in the movies. This has been Gilbert Gottfried's Amazing Colossal Podcast, here with my sidekick, Fred. Frank. I fucked up Frank. That's okay. Usually it's the last name I fuck up. It's Frank getting worse. Sent- Frank. Oh, I, I, Frank's a really hard foreign name. Just say you're uh, Jewish. Just, just say French money. This has been Gilbert Gottfried's Amazing Colossal Podcast with my sidekick, Frank Santopatrick. <laughs>